Hi, I'm Fumi OK. Welcome to the stream. We wrap up a whole week of episodes that have been suggested by you, our online community, with a look at the coronavirus and also climate change. It was an idea that was suggested by us, to us, by a filmmaker and climate activist called Slater Jewel Kemker. Have a look here at how she framed the discussion. She wanted to talk about the intersection between the COVID and climate crises. And our YouTube chat is open. I know some of you have already jumped in it. You can add your comments, add your ideas about climate change and coronavirus, and then you too can be in the stream. I want to introduce you to the guests. The guests are going to introduce themselves to you. Hello, Alvin. Welcome to the stream. Tell everybody who you are. Thank you. My name is Alvin Munyasia. I work with Oxfam International Pan-Africa Program. Together with our partners, we present the voices of ordinary citizens to the Africa Union and member states up to the global level on issues to do with food security and climate change. Alvin, it's great to have you. Welcome to the stream, Gillary. Tell everybody who you are. Thanks for having me. I'm a climate science uh, and environment correspondent with AJ Plus and National Geographic Channel. Thanks for being in the stream and welcome back to the stream, Christiana. There may be one or two people in the world who do not know who you are, but I guarantee they know your work. Introduce yourselves. Well, everyone knows who you are, Kami. So thank you for the invitation. Lovely to be with you again. I'm Cristiana Figueres. I am a Costa Rican citizen. I'm speaking to you from Costa Rica. I used to work for the United Nations and had the pleasure to lead the negotiations into the Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, and I continue to be the faithful servant of the global atmosphere and our wonderful planet. So Christiana and guess, I want you to start with making that connection between where we are with a global pandemic and climate change and climate action. Christiana, how would you sum up that connection? Well, I would say that uh, if you look at it rather superficially, one obviously notices that nature is having a ball right now. We are seeing birds, butterflies, and, and bees come back to unmowed lawns. We have animals roaming the streets. We have clear skies. We have air that feels fresh uh, and, and so much healthier because we have paralyzed the economy. So while the environment has actually been benefited by the last two months, it is actually nothing to celebrate because that is not the kind of repair and regeneration that we talk about when we are engaging with climate change or with biodiversity protection. We're not talking about something that is circumstantial or something that is only temporary. We are talking about the need to have sustained efforts this year, we already know that we will be dropping in greenhouse gas emissions by a whopping 8%, first time in the history of humanity. And it's pretty close to what we need, 7.6. But we know that as soon as we engage again with the economy, that that is going to go back up. So what we mm -hmm. need is a very different change. And most importantly, Femi, the decarbonization, the protection of biodiversity and working on climate change cannot come at the huge human cost that this has come. It cannot come at the cost of human lives and millions of human livelihoods. So interesting exercise that we have had, but not what we want to continue. Uh, uh -huh. uh, Gilly, let me bring you in here. You are in LA, which is notorious for uh, pollution, smog, cars. And one of the first pictures I saw of what the difference lockdown made was of a beautiful clear skied Los Angeles. I'm going to show you some more pictures right now. We've got Beirut, we've got Venice, we have Delhi. These are amazing. Before lockdown, during lockdown pictures, what do you make of this? What is this telling us about what a couple of days, a couple of weeks can do to our environment? Well, what's been incredible is that the drop in pollution and the clearing of skies, it's had a tangible effect where you can literally step outside and breathe in much cleaner air. And as Christina was saying, you could see 
the birds out, the animals out, and it seems like nature's having a comeback. It's been so hard to explain climate change because it's less tangible. It takes so much longer for CO2 to be removed from the atmosphere. So you don't get that direct impact. And these past few months of clean air have been a great way for people to realize what life could be like, the quality of life we can have. A big kind of connector between the two crises for me has been the lungs. That's been our Achilles heel in this crisis. And cities where people are breathing in polluted air and tolerating that, they've been harder hit uh, with the coronavirus. So there's interesting links that are happening between the two major crises. I'm just going to go to YouTube here, Alvin, and I'm going to put this to you. George Zulis says, maybe it's a good idea that once a year for one month, we can shut the world down and help the planet heal. Do you think that would work <laughs> in Kenya? Could you just close, close for a month, walk or go cycling? Would that work? Uh, I, I don't think it will, it will work uh, because for me, in my view, inequality and poverty increases the vulnerability to climate change and, and pandemics like corona. It is the common denominator. Inequality, especially between rich countries and poor countries, it is the most obvious flow of the current neoliberal economic model, just as my colleagues uh, Christiana has put it. Both the climate crisis and the pandemics exacerbate the persistent inequalities at different levels of the society, and those that are bound to suffer the, uh, the most uh, from these extreme effects of these two phenomena are at the poorest, and they have not seen society. So it's it's not about uh, shutting down the world. It is about addressing the issues of inequality. Where, think of it, in a global economy where the world's richest 1% of people have more than twice as much as wealth as 4.6 billion of the poorest people on earth. And this is a report that we've done as Oxfam. So the ability of this majority of population right now to, to even access the resources they need to holistically build their resilience and bounce back to the global crisis is severely limited and in some cases not uh, non-existent. So it's about fixing the economic model, not about mm -hmm. shutting uh, the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, let me share this with you, guests. Uh, this is from a doctor, and we've seen so much from doctors recently, but doctors and climate change, that's a little bit special. Want to prevent the next pandemic? This doctor is prescribing climate action. I want to hear what he has to say. His name is Dr. Basu, and this is his take on the intersection between climate change and also the global pandemic. Let's have a look. India and Bangladesh were reporting thousands of new cases of COVID-19. And by midweek, the countries were monitoring Super Cyclone Amphan, one of the most intense cyclones ever measured in the Bay of Bengal. One crisis does not end because of another one. And in South Asia this week, the COVID-19 crisis will collide with the climate crisis. Many of the solutions of the climate crisis, such as stopping deforestation and rampant agriculture, are essential to mitigating the risks of the next pandemic. We must pass transformative policy that end the era of burning fossil fuels and restore the stability of our ecosystems. Our unprecedented times demand bold thinking. And in this moment of profound disruption, we must fulfill our moral responsibility to the safety of our children by investing in the health of our planet. Christiana, Guillory, I saw you both nodding. Christiana, you go first. Guillory, you pick up second. Well, very well put, um, and uh, I, a, a simplistic and perhaps irresponsible uh, uh, summary of that is human health equals global health. We have been so used to thinking that human health can be completely independent from and not affected by global health, and we are seeing that that is not true. So we have to understand health in its fullest interpretation, and that goes all the way from individual humans to the entire planet and to every one of the ecosystems that actually are at the basis of our life. Finally, perhaps we have understood this. I think the COVID crisis has just slapped us in the face with lesson upon lesson upon lesson. Um, and the question is going to be, we're learning those lessons every day. We are on the greatest learning curve that we have ever been. The question is, once we open the doors of our homes and offices, 
Will we remember what we have learned? Will we take the lessons into policy? Will we take the lessons into individual behavioral change? Will we take the changes and make them sustain, we take the lessons and make them sustained changes and not just once a month? Gary, before you jump in and, and you continue our conversation, I want to go to Sean Lindsay, who's in our YouTube chat. Sean Lindsay says, we will see mass reindustrialization, so it will make things worse. He's not feeling very optimistic about where we are right now, Gary. He's absolutely right. Already in countries like China, we're seeing what's called the rebound effect, where they're trying to make up for lost economy and working double time. Factories are pumping out way more emissions. Already scientists are starting to see a spike in levels. And that's the fear, that ripple effect across the planet. As everybody's trying to reboot the economy, get everybody back to work, that we're going to really just lose all the great gains that we have made in this short amount of time. Uh, something that the doctor talked about that I'm really happy that he touched upon is the issue of deforestation. It's been harder to explain that link to the general public, but the more we cut down trees and enter the habitats of wild animals and take over their homes, the more we're going to have these viruses, uh, you know, spreading across the planet. We need to make sure we talk about overpopulation, we talk about how we build cities and cutting down forests and natural habitats to create homes for humans, sky rises, more apartment blocks is not the solution either. We have to change the way we live and dwell in our cities. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at some of the pictures from Nairobi, Alvin, where you're based and people were marveling at being able to see Mount Kenya. It was like, whoa, we can see Mount Kenya, that's amazing. But in terms of a very tangible difference that this global pandemic may well have on the environment around East Africa, the need for there to be cleaner air um, and also climate justice, what are you seeing that's changed or changing? You see, Nairobi and Africa has, has clean air. When we talk about emissions, Africa contributes about 3% of, of global emissions and, and Christiana is here. So Africa is also bearing the brunt of, of climate change. So we are demanding for rich countries to, to, play, to pay the, the climate debt. What we need in this part of the world is for uh, the international community to honor their commitment of the Paris Agreement. Let's talk about climate mm -hmm. finance. They, they agreed that they will be investing 100 billion of climate finance uh, to strengthen Africa's response to issues of climate justice. This is critical for countries in Africa that are vulnerable who need to reboot their economies in a sustainable and resilient way. Adaptation is needed to help vulnerable communities withstand future shocks. They are already suffering from uh, climate issues and the risk of this pandemic will leave, even, will leave our people even more vulnerable to future climate shocks. So for us, but, it's about Alvin, honoring. Yeah. yeah, but Alvin, you could have said that this time last year and nobody was listening. And now you're saying it during the global pandemic. Are you getting more people to listen now? Are they more focused or less focused? We have been, we have been saying this uh, during COP25. <laughs> activists like mm -hmm. Vanessa Nakate, we were together with them uh, until one, uh, one of our comrades in the fourth estate cropped them out. We have been pushing for accountability and uh, transparency from the international community to pay mm -hmm. uh, the climate debt and we have been campaigning to enable developing economies already drowning in, in the catastrophe of climate justice uh, to be assisted through the issue of climate finance because climate change is real and Africa has contributed uh, a little on, on, on the catastrophe. So that must be honored. We yes, will continue to fight for climate justice. Mm -hmm. And, and your message stays right there. It hasn't changed. That message remains regardless of where we are in terms of the global health of international citizens. Let me bring in uh, Sasanska Filakasari. He is the lead in energy at Oxfam International. He's kind of thinking how we think about this differently. Maybe we shouldn't be thinking about cars and pollution and factories, etc. Maybe we're thinking about a new kind of energy. Here he is. 
COVID-19 shows how we can and must prioritize building renewable energy systems which are much more resilient to future shocks. Additionally, current lockdowns could lend themselves to those of us who are in a position to revisit some of our life choices and how to live more sustainably. Things such as transportation choices, getting on a plane or not, empty office buildings which could be converted to sustainable housing and green buildings. Could be some silver linings of how we can build back better. Gilly, it's spooky. You've just, just done a report for AJ Plus about this very idea, green jobs coming out of the global pandemic. Tell us more. Well, this is a great opportunity to get people back to work and to retrain industries, people who come from industries that are so fossil fuel dependent. You know, it's a chance to get people back to work, to retrain and sort of set up a new economy. My, my fear, though, as I've sort of been investigating a bit deeper, is that that in itself is a Band-Aid solution if we don't start looking at our own consumption issues. You know, completely just electrifying, you know, getting electric cars back on the road and mining lithium and, and creating materials to build these cars. That's not the solution. We really have to look at our habits and our, our addiction to consumption at the root level. And I want to start with myself before I point the finger to everybody else. You know, this pandemic has made me realize how I do my own work. You know, I'm an international correspondent. I was in Australia with the bushfires, the Amazon, covering deforestation. And here I am with a simple lighting kit, a microphone, and an iPhone, producing films that are having just as much of an impact, if not more, than my field reports. So do I really need to be traveling the world telling these stories? Can I be collaborating with local filmmakers and, and stock images and telling just as compelling a story? Um, I'm having my own you know, sh mental shift that's happening and my own look at my consumption rates. And I think that's where we need to start. Luciana. Well, I totally agree. I've, I've been doing exactly the same thing. I have also been traveling the world with my message about uh, climate justice, about the vulnerability, especially of developing countries, about the urgency to meet the, the climate crisis that is not unlinked uh, to the COVID crisis, as we have heard. And my experience is exactly the same. Do I really want to travel three times around the world to go to a meeting that lasts one hour or one day or even four days? Fortunately, we have now all become so much more fluent in these technologies that allow us to participate, to engage with each other, and to have perhaps not the exact same impact as if we were personally in our bodies present with each other but honestly the marginal difference is just not worth it it's not worth the additional cost it's not worth the additional emissions it's not worth the additional um drain on our health it's just not worth it so i also think that we will be having major, major shifts, not only in the way that we, um, that we travel, we will be traveling less, certainly for business. We will not be commuting as much. We will be commuting much less because companies are understanding that they could actually save on office spaces by having 40 or 60 or 50% of their workers working from home just as effectively. We might even be affecting urban design because as we've heard, we, if there are not that many cars, we have a much better use for, um, for streets and for parking places. We will, can you imagine if we now have cities that actually have much cleaner air? It's going to be, if, if we remember the lessons that we have, that we are <laughs> gathering here from these two months, yeah. these are the lessons that we should have been learning, you know, for years um, and didn't. And now they're just being squashed into the reality right in front of our noses. And our obligation and our responsibility here is to take those lessons and make it a reality, starting from the bottom up. If the new reality that we create, we cannot recreate what we had in the past. This is not about recovering in the economy. This is about resetting, redesigning, reinventing an economy that is more resilient, that is more fair, that starts from the bottom up, creation of jobs, but not jobs that are going to disappear five or 10 years from now because those sectors basically have run their wrong. We have to be able to think into the future as we redesign the economy. 
Because, mm. Jana, let me just remind everybody something that you said right at the beginning, and, and this is something that is, is a headline that jumped out at me. It's quite a recent one. Global CO2 emissions could fall by up to 7% this year amid the pandemic because of the lockdowns and less industry, etc. But we got this question in from Twitter from Richella, and she says, could the drop in emissions serve as a precedent to redefine international climate action targets? You've told us many times we have 10 years to get ourselves into gear to really tackle climate change, to really act. So do you think these last few months, perhaps another year of slower economy, less traffic, us not going out so much, what difference could that make? Well, you know, this decade really is the defining decade for, for climate because we have to be at one half the emissions that we had at the start of this year, not right now, one half um, by 2030. So a 50% drop in over 10 years is ambitious because we've never done it, but it is doable because we have shown this year that actually that was a 7% that was in that article. The latest data actually pulls us already at 8% drop. Now, as we said, not the way that we want to reach that. But it does mean that we require both individual behavior changes as well as top-down regulations from governments that are going to help us optimize our emission reduction potential without reducing the well-being standards. That's the trick. We have to separate greenhouse gas growth from economic growth, especially in developing countries. Those two things have to be delinked ASAP. Mm. I told you at the very beginning of the show, viewers, that this idea came to us from for this discussion from Slater Jewel Kemper, who is a climate activist and a filmmaker. Uh, and she wanted to just put a little period on the end of this conversation. What has she been thinking about in the last couple of months of lockdown? Here she is. There's a lot of time to think and a lot of time to reflect. And what I keep coming back to again and again throughout the surreal nature of this and the heartbreaking nature of this is how fast we've been able to move as people and adapt to this crisis. If we can take something that we always thought was not flexible and actually change everything about it within a matter of months and weeks, then if we can do that for this threat and this crisis, it gives me some optimism that we can actually rise to the challenge of the climate crisis and adapt as people and be able to create the society and the world that we need to live in in order to survive. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna to go to YouTube one more time to Shivansh Jatendra and he asks, what is the big takeaway from this experience? We have about two minutes left, guess. I'm just going to ask you to do your elevator pitch, your takeaway. Alvin, you go first. Yeah. We are now approaching at crossroads. This is an, an opportunity that we must not miss. We can either continue with the business as usual way of development, or we can change. We can transform the way we do things and build an economy that nurtures our people and our planet. This is a political choice that is at stake. And for our sake mm -hmm. and for the sake of our children, we urge our leaders internationally and locally to choose the latter because sticking with the status quo will only bring about more suffering and destruction of our planet. Hillary, lessons learned. You should have a personal lesson learned. What's your takeaway? I mean, I couldn't agree more, but I have to say amidst all this suffering and fear and loss that we're all going through, we have to make sure that we hold on to our environmental protections. So rebooting the economy and getting people back to work is really important, but we don't need to lax important environmental protections to get back to work. So we need to keep an eye on those and make sure governments aren't swiping off those key protections in the name of the economy and rebooting and getting people back because we fought hard for those and they're gonna protect us in the future. Christiana, what would be the most impactful sentence that you can deliver so people remember it? <laughs> well, agreeing with my two wonderful colleagues here, I would summarize by saying our transition to sustainability has never been as visible and never been as achievable as it is right now. Let us not miss this opportunity. Christiana, Guillory, 
Alvin, thank you very much for helping us explore the connection between the coronavirus pandemic, our environment, and climate change. Thanks everybody for watching. See you next time. Take care.